Thanks for downloading show 117 of the C-Suite podcast, the uh, ninth in our special series of episodes that we're recording in partnership with the European PR agency Taito and its own Without Borders podcast, where we are interviewing leaders of unicorn companies to find out about the key issues, pain points and challenges that startups face and how they can address them with a strategic approach to marketing and communications. My name is Russell Goldsmith and once again, I'm hosting this uh, unicorn interview with Taito's founder, Brendan Craigie, and joining us both online is Adrian. Adrian Nussenbaum, co-founder and CEO of Miracle, a global leader in online marketplaces that just recently announced its unicorn status. So welcome to the show, Adrian. Um, I thought it'd be good if you can maybe start by providing us with a quick overview of Miracle and uh, just explain what you're doing differently to other e-commerce platforms and businesses. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure, pleasure. and uh, looking forward to the conversation. So Explaining what Miracle does is always a challenge <laughs> because what we do is new and it's always hard to figure out. And I guess for, for you and as PR people, how do you explain something new, especially in a B2B context in software? So in a very simple way, Miracle provides the expertise, the technology and the partner ecosystem that allows businesses, B2B or B2C businesses, retailers, manufacturers, distributors, to launch and run an online marketplace. And that's really what we do in a very simple way. When we, when we get to your question about you know, what is different, what we do differently, it's fundamentally the business, power, the business model that we power that is different. If you think of commerce for decades, commerce has been uh, a very simple business model where a company manufactures or buys products and then sells them. And they make money by the price, you know, the difference between the price people buy and how much it costs to procure those, those goods or make those goods. As digital has emerged over the last 20 years, we've seen, the world has seen the emergence of a new business model, which people call marketplaces, platforms, and you know, just to kind of put some names, the, some of the pioneers were eBay, and today we all know about Amazon, Alibaba, Uber, Airbnb, Farfetch, and, and many, many other platforms in all geographies. And so what those businesses do fundamentally different is that they make money not by making or buying products, but by connecting sellers and buyers of goods who then, you know, uh, sellers will ship the products and those companies, Uber, Airbnb, Alibaba, they will take a commission on those sales. And that's really how they've been going. And those companies are now accounting for over 50% of online sales in the world. So Miracle, if you want to see it in a very simple way, is providing the leading technology that allows any business around the world to create their own version of Alibaba, Uber, Amazon, that fits their specific business line, industry, customer needs. So in a way we are pioneering or helping people pioneer really a, a profound transformation in their, in their business model. Um, I mentioned in, in the uh, intro just there um, that you've only just become a unicorn. So that was following this announcement um, that you've raised $300 million uh, funding uh, round. Um, and so that's valued you now uh, or valued the business at, at $1.5 billion. Has that changed the perception of the company in any way? Yeah, it's good that you corrected. The, it has not valued me because if my, <laughs> if, my mom, if my mom was on the podcast, she would probably say that I'm worth much more than a billion <laughs> five and probably, you know, have no value. There's no value. But anyways, let's be being more serious. Obviously, it's funny. I was just on a call with my um, my co-founder, and and he was telling us that since we announced the raise, our our ability and velocity in recruiting talents, which is the core of what makes up the value of a company, specifically in our labs department, which, as you all know, it's a highly competitive uh, market. Uh, he was saying that our capacity capacity and velocity has had increased by almost 10x in, in the last couple of months. So I think definitely it, it, it has, you know, put Miracle more on the radar. And, you know, 
as PR folks, it's hard to put a B2B company on the radar uh, when you don't sell phones or you don't sell magic instruments or cars and stuff like electric cars, you know, when you sell a software that enables a new business. So it has put us more on the radar. And I guess it also, you know, it's, is it the combination of uh, what lies ahead, you know, IPO, uh, global leadership role, uh, potential, you know, acceleration of the, the increase of value? Is it that it reduces the perception of risk, which from our end is kind of strange coming, you know, thinking of where we were nine years ago when we started, like we, we felt we've de-risked the business quite a bit already. But yeah, definitely, um, it has created a lot of a lot of visibility, and and it has put Miracle on the map, which which is good, and Excellent. which is something we've we've you know not always been the best at in the <laughs> well, past. I, I might let Brendan come back on on PRing B two B companies and and mm. you know how difficult or, or maybe easy that that could be. But just just you know on on this whole growth plan, I mean, you know. Ha- Obviously, the three hundred million dollars uh, raised just just now. But you know, what what's the plan to continue this? I, I guess you could call this hyper growth. So, the, the the market we we're addressing is a very nascent market because we are powering, as I was explaining in my long winded introduction, we're powering a what we believe to be a profound and long term shift in business models. We we fundamentally believe that all the traditional players in in the industries that we know more or less retail distribution manufacturing they are at a crossroad because of of the increase in digitization of their customer journeys and we believe that part of the evolutions and changes they will have to make involve adapting their business model to a new business model that allows more scale more faster growth, better ability to to bring your ecosystem together. And this business model is fundamentally what marketplaces power. So we are just at the beginning of our of our journey. If you want to, you know, if I if I kind of share some some insider information from 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 our from our fundraising, roughly Miracle, you know, has today 250 plus clients you know, from very large enterprises, uh, Carrefour, uh, uh, Siemens, Toyota, Airbus, uh, to, uh, you know, upcoming digital native brands. So we really support a broad band of, of, of customers. In our plan, we our ambition by 2025, so five years from now, is to increase that number of customers by five. And we are, you know, in a market where we believe there's probably 30, 40,000 companies that have the size, the brand, the ambitions, the, the ecosystem of partners that would allow them to, to, to create those, those marketplaces and run them and be at the center of them. So, so clearly we, we are at the beginning of the journey and to achieve our, our ambitions, number one, it's people. You know, since the beginning of the company, it's always been the same. You need to hire great people and you need to retain great people and you need to grow great people. And, you know, whether it's in our labs team, it's our sales team, in our customer success team. So it's first and foremost, people investing in our products. And also, you know, as a company starting to, to look around us, if there's an opportunity for, for Miracle to, to be a, a consolidator of other uh, companies and technologies that, play well in our in our ecosystem it's really exciting adrian and um as as russell says i kind of like um for my sins i've spent my whole career focused on sort of the b2b communication side of things so it's it's the area that i find most exciting and that things that are not kind of like obvious and need a bit of uh, clever thought you know uh, kind of present quite an interesting challenge but um what do you think has um, been kind of one of the, the biggest factors in your success so far? It may sound a bit uh, immodest, but I think first thing has been a great vision. And it's easy for me to say that because it entirely falls under my, my business partner, Philippe. So, and by that, it's not that, oh, there's, there, he's a genius. He had a vision. 
it's the way we've stayed true to our vision. And frankly, it was difficult because when you start a company and you, you spend your days telling people, hey, this is the old world, but there's a new world coming and you need to adapt, you need to change. And people are looking at you like, huh? you know, uh, or, or they're seeing you as the devil who wants to disrupt the entire business. Staying true to this vision and knowing that this will, you know, come through at some point is really what has driven the culture of the company. We, if you ask people at Miracle, they, they all believe that they are working at a company that is pioneering something new, that, that is disrupting industries and businesses, that is helping companies evolve and grow and survive. And, and you have that spirit. It's a, it's a real, real cement to the, the company culture. And, and you know, speaking of culture, the, the second thing, you know, great vision, great, great people. And that also has been hard because it's a very competitive market. Uh, our rate in, in recruiting of people we, we interview is 3%. So, so it's, it makes it hard to scale at the pace you want. Uh, when I moved to the U.S. to start a U.S. business, you know, we, we were nothing. Nobody cared about us in the U.S. And making sure that I was able to, to cement a team in Boston, where I was based, with, you know, in, in that's a pre-work-from-home, uh, uh, everywhere type of world, it, it, it makes it even more difficult to hire great people. So there is really this, this notion of, you know, I think the vision, the people and the product. And, and one thing which is really uh, recognized by our clients is it's it, Miracle has built a product which, you know, encompasses a, a, a long experience of the founders in marketplaces and, and there's a real know-how, it's purpose built. So it's, it's you know, that, that triangle that mm. we try to stay true every day. <laughs> I think um, it's interesting. I, I can totally imagine that you mentioned that you're getting kind of a 10x uplift in people contacting you, potential candidates and things. But at, at the beginning, you don't, you haven't got that kind of $300 million raise. So the vision is kind of essential, really, isn't it, to get people to, to buy into what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and it's been interesting to see how, you know, uh, we, we've, we've had people come and go like every other business over the years. And, and, and we see that our most successful people are also the one who have, you know, um, weathered storms, but, you know, stayed on and engaged because they, they, they saw, like the vision was not just a founder exclusive vision. It's something that's really shared across the team. Yeah, I like that. I like seeing people that have kind of done a bit of a distance with a company because they've kind of like um, been prepared to work through some of the challenges and things. Um, just thinking about the kind of the disruption that you're you're driving, um, you're obviously kind of making, you're opening up new possibilities with your with your platform. But would you say that at the same time you're seeing the emergence of a new type of customer who maybe doesn't want to be kind of just a you know selling via amazon or ebay you kind of is that kind of an opportunity is that kind of like a drive from customers that you're seeing yes i i think if you if you if you split our customers in a very simplistic way you have incumbents businesses who have been around for decades centuries sometimes and you have uh, new digital native businesses. And, and if you think of, um, of how those people go about thinking about their strategy, the, the incumbents, as we know, they've, they've not led the emergence of digital because it was new and as, mm, many incumbents you first you observe you evaluate you question and sometimes you know when you wake up it's sometimes too late and amazon exists because people let let it exist in the beginning they looked at it and said hey this is just a bookstore ha 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 
and and we know what happened so those businesses those incumbent businesses they they have a choice they are the turning point where they're either going to be consolidated into digital giants which is oh i'm going to use amazon as a seller i'm going to sell on amazon you know when when you see department stores for example who are saying announcing that they're opening a store on amazon the world is upside down like the 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 amazon of the physical world now depends on amazon's business to to exist so you, you in in a in a digital world which accelerates this kind of consolidation because it's all about anything anytime anywhere for the customers you have businesses who are going to refuse to change and they are going to be consolidated or die and you have businesses who are going to react and and that's what our clients do and they are going to say you know what i also can be the consolidator of my industry my vertical my ecosystem and and this is what we you know we refer to as platform pioneers the 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 businesses which are non incumbent but are you know digital native for them it's a completely di- different paradigm they they start a business today in commerce and distribution and they have to ask themselves a simple question do i embrace the business model of the past you know walmart costco well, or do i embrace the business model of today and the future amazon alibaba airbnb uber in some way shape or form and most businesses today digital they choose obviously the 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 latter because they believe that's where there's there's more growth um and the idea is not just to copy existing businesses but to find and bring so that's why for example we work with companies digital natives who are establishing marketplaces in um you know highly curated uh, ethically sourced uh, fashion you know it's not just a one stop shop where you find every clothes around so they they are use they are creating they are using the marketplace model but they are bringing a differentiation and and that's really what what you know what's interesting into what what we're doing and have the opportunity to serve today just picking up on something you just said about when Amazon started and people saying, oh, they're only a bookstore. I mean, I don't know whether or not you can comment on this, but do you think there was always a vision to go beyond that or, or it just, it just grew sort of organically. And, and how does that, I was, I was just thinking how other startups, you know, grow and suddenly you find actually what we do has, has far more opportunities than actually we set out. Yeah. So I'm not in the position to, to say whether Jeff, B Jeff Bezos the day he started Amazon had this idea already that Amazon would would you know add a marketplace very quickly and become what it is i can tell from you know his communications that it came very quickly and and what what drove it was was that as amazon was trying to grow online they were investing massively in building a brand in bidding traffic on their website and investing in their in you know e-commerce infrastructure and so they were building a, a a database of customers and they were they realized very quickly that those customers were interested in buying more products and and that there was two way they could get those products into the hands of the customer there was the capital intensive way you know try to buy and source and stock the products and there was the capital not intensive way which was to launch a marketplace and and that's you know that's why very quickly in their journey they launched a, a first version of the marketplace and they stumbled upon upon a few a few iterations but there was always this idea which is something we try to preach to our clients today that you as a, as a as a traditional business you think of making money by uh, monetizing the assets that you you create or you buy and which means you know you you buy a furniture and you resell the furniture you're monetizing assets but what amazon did early is say you know not only are we going to monetize the assets but there are other assets that we are creating 
like having people who come to your website, it's an asset. And, and how could we mutualize that asset in order to create new areas of monetization? And, and this is exactly the concept of becoming a platform business. It's, it's thinking that there is value to generate by giving access to the, asset, the assets that you've created and, giving, and monetizing this access. So if you're a manufacturer of industrial machinery and you have a lot of customers who come to you to buy their machinery, but then there's, there's an ecosystem of millions of parts and tens of thousands of parts providers. If you're able to bring those parts providers on your website and connect them with your customers better, faster, you're, you're, you're mutualizing your assets and you're creating value for the customers, for your distributors and for yourself. And that triangular uh, value creation framework is fundamental of, of the shift in, in, in business models that, that we're seeing with, with those marketplaces and platforms. It's really exciting. Um, could you maybe just elaborate a little bit more on, on what you mean by being a platform pioneer? You use it quite a lot in your communications. Um, is it about describing what you're doing or is it about describing the customers that are working with you? Are they the platform pioneers? The answer is a little bit in your in the duality of the answer is a little bit in your question, but but the the initial goal was to to find a way to recognize the courage of our customers and to to um, to emphasize on on how pride uh, proud they should be of the initiatives they're they're taking the risks they're taking. And, um, and so we, we, we like, you know, that, uh, that kind of pioneer spirit, uh, you know, for example, Salesforce uses the trailblazers uh, as a reference to their customers. And, you know, yes, there is a marketing element always in the culture that uh, just don't call a customer a customer, uh, you know, in, in retail, you call them val my valued guests or, but we wanted to, to, to really create kind of a club uh, that that would really recognize the merit of of people in that we work with who because what you don't know is that very often they they need to create internal alignment within their organizations they they need to 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 be agents of 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 a vision uh, they need to fight sometimes internally they they need to put their their job sometimes on, on the line and when you think of it if the project doesn't work, they'll get into trouble. If the project works, it's not like they will be promoted to CEO overnight. But so, so really there is courage in, in, in recognizing people who believe that their, their life where you spend 75% of it working can be a better life if you're actually doing stuff which is innovative, which is transformative, which is new. So, you know, calling them pioneers and you know, pioneers of the platform economy was was kind of the way we we decided to anchor our, our communication, the way we recognize them, the summits we organize and stuff like that. Um, let's go into a bit more detail then about Miracle Connect. So that's your, your platform. It's described as bringing together sellers, partners and marketplace operators. Do you want to just tell us a little bit more, you know, about how it works and, and where you see it heading next? Yeah, so... Miracle Connect is really, in a way, um, reflective of this, you know, this expression which which says you 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 put your you put your money where your mouth is, something like that. Uh, as a business, we explain every day that you have an opportunity with digital to consolidate your ecosystem and to be at the center of an ecosystem because the assets that you provide to that ecosystem are central. They are the biggest common de denominator. So if you think of Miracle at this point of our journey, it's 250 plus live marketplaces around the world. It's 40,000 sellers connected and selling onto one or many of those marketplaces. It's also um, dozens of uh, 
of technology partners who are providing technologies and and services that support the sellers or the operators of those of those marketplaces. So with Miracle Connect, we we realized that the biggest common denominator amongst all those people is Miracle. It's that that technology we have built, which is a if you think the anchor onto which connects all those uh, all those parties, and and we we could bring value to all of them by creating really an online platform where they also can connect together easier. So if you're a seller today and you, you want to sell on 10 Miracle marketplaces, you basically need to connect individually with those 10 marketplaces. With Miracle Connect, you are now able to create one connection and, and, and automatically connect with all of them. And it's it's a circular type of, of, of economy and platform. So that's really the, the goal behind Miracle Connect. You, you touched on earlier, Adrian, um, about the fact that you're kind of working with companies of different sizes. So, you know, so you, we know that you're working with Best Buy Canada and Kruger, but then at the same time, you're doing a lot of work with digital natives like Coravin and, and Motherly. Which sounds, um, it sounds kind of like there's kind of equal possibilities for those different size organizations. Do you see that sort of, you're having a bit of a, a democratizing effect on the e-commerce space in that respect. Yeah, I, I think the, once again, to what I was saying earlier, the, the common denominator between those, those four businesses is that they, they, they have created assets and they believe that they can uh, aggregate a broader ecosystem around those assets. So if you think of Best Buy Canada, what is their asset? Great brand, great stores, years of serving customers in the electronic space. It's a, it's a, it's a product universe where Best Buy may have 100,000 products, but they could be selling 5 million products. Kroger, great grocer, same thing. They're, they're selling fresh grocery, but people also want a lot of other products. Motherly, they've created a great you know, content destination for uh, pregnant women and post-pregnancy women, there's an ecosystem. So Coravin, unique technology to pour wine without opening, uh, removing the cork. Same thing. Every time you have the ingredients of assets, focus, uh, ability to aggregate uh, a, an ecosystem around you to, to provide more to the customers. And that's, that's really the... And it goes back to that, that same point, you know, do you want to be consolidated, which is Coravin selling on Amazon, or do you want to be also a consolidator, which is Coravin saying, you know what, I can aggregate a community of other products for wine aficionados who don't want to go and buy their stuff on Amazon necessarily. And presumably on that, in respect to that last point you just made, people can be both, right? Absolutely. But, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, to the extent that uh, we, we know, I mean, to the extent that Amazon, as, as we've seen in the past, uh, has, I would say, a, a business model that results sometimes in, in, in negative experiences for its partners, which can be in two forms. One of them is, I call it, you know, being Amazon uh, basic basic kified, <laughs> which basically means uh, you sell great products. Amazon sees they're great and they have them made under their own label and and they list them first and you're a bit behind. You know it's, uh, it's... and the other thing is uh, as a seller on Amazon, you're exposed to uh, you know the ability uh, that Amazon may have to to cut you off, to de-rank you, to... So our customers are establishing their marketplace in a, in a stronger uh, spirit of partnership with their, with their partners. That's great. And how important do you see kind of like the, the focus on B2B e-commerce as being um, for Miracle's long-term future? It, it is, you know, today, 40% of our business and will be uh, by, you know, 2025, 75% of our business. It's a, it's a, it's a much broader and deeper market uh, because B2B is a very 
generic word that spans from, you know, uh, wholesale distribution of uh, of pipes and toilet equipment to uh, healthcare products, uh, all the way to manufacturers of planes and reactives, or it's an endless world, the B two B. Exciting, and could you? T- to talk a little bit about um, the the company's culture, the culture that you've built. I, you know, understand that you've kind of ensued the the kind of the typical Silicon Valley culture. You're obviously got a lot of roots in in France. What what's what's that? How's that kind of ended ended up uh, in terms of how your cu- culture is? How you would define your culture? I think our 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 culture is anchored around. Um, around a set of, uh, of values, uh, which if I, if I kind of, um, of, of, of oversimplify them would, would be this idea that we are, uh, we are a disruptor. We're, we're like, we created our market. And, and many tech companies, they always say, we create our category. We create, but it's fundamentally, when you ask them what is their benefit, they'll say, uh, we're, doing some, we're helping do something faster or better compared to what exists. Miracle, we didn't come and say, hey, uh, you're using this software and you can do it in 10 minutes. With us, you'll do it in five minutes. Or it, it, there's not this notion of a... So, so it's really a center piece of our culture, which is you got to be, you have a notion, to, how do you make it happen? You need to be experts because you need to be trusted by the people you are, you are going to sell to. You need to be um, very uh, team oriented. And, and once again, everyone says, yeah, we're a big team, we're a family, we're this. But in our case, if you try to run solo, you, you, you will very hardly succeed in, in, in convincing people to, to embrace the vision that you're, that you're selling them. So, so there is this notion of expertise, there is this notion of team, and there is this notion of hard work. And I think work hard is a bit taboo in some uh, tech uh, cultures. And, and, and I guess, you know... Um, uh, you know, we don't have nap rooms. We don't have open snack bars everywhere. We don't have on-site laundry. But at the same time, we don't expect you to to live in the office because we feed you, we wash you, and we entertain you. We also expect you to have a life. And, and I think that um, in France, we we often say that we we work to live and we don't live to work. And, and I think that uh, seeing how it's the number one destination for tourists in every year, there, there has to be some truth in that. And it's not just wine and cheese. And, um, and so I think one of the, one of the interesting challenge, having built a, you know, a, a company that was born in France and, and now has you know, uh, 50% of his business on the other side of the, of the ocean, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, is, is trying to blend the best of both worlds and um and it's 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 difficult uh you know communication values uh for example you know during covid we we have you know if you ask people in france 95 percent of them they say they want to go to the office if you ask people in the us 22 percent of them said they want to they want to be in in the office it doesn't mean that people want to work or not work you know and one would argue oh yeah they want to be in the office to smoke cigarettes and have coffee with their friends others would say oh they want to work from home to be in their pjs and work their dog i'm joking but there is a you know over overcoming those cultural uh, biases is also a, a very important challenge when you're when you're trying to to grow a company uh, into a global company, and when you're, you're trying to establish a software leader in a world where traditionally, if you want to be a software leader, you need to be a U.S. company at, in some ways. It, it's uh, it's also an exciting uh, an exciting journey. What, what was it like for you personally moving from France to Boston? 
you know, it was, um, it was not completely new because I, first of all, I had started my first business in New York in 2000. So I, I, I kind of knew, uh, uh, it was not a cultural shock. My, my, my wife has dual citizenship. My, my kids have dual citizenship, but it was, um, it was a very big challenge because First of all, there was the uh, you can't fuck up, call, you know, pressure, which it was big because uh, you are kind of that pioneer yourself who, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to go and seek gold and uh, you want to end up uh, drunk in a, in a bar uh, like some of the, the cowboys in, in the Wild West. But um, so there was that pressure. There was the um, kind of how long is it going to take is it going to you know is it going to work you 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 land uh, you need to hire people i've made tons of hiring mistakes i've had tons of people join and resign 3 months later like the the time it took to cement uh, a core team which is still there today 4 years in probably 12 months the the time it took to 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 get to a level of business traction where you're like, you know, I don't know if I'll be Microsoft, but I'm going to make it some way, some way. Uh, it probably took 18 to almost 24 months. Um, and so, so that was kind of the hard part, which was, uh, ev- you know, everyone's looking at you, you've raised money to do that. And, um, and understanding the, the local codes, uh, most of the French entrepreneurs, for, it's funny when they come, they give me a call sometimes and they say, yeah, can you share your experience? I say, okay, so there's a few things you're going to go through. First, you're going to be told you need to invest more in communications and PR. And you're going to say, well, this is complete bullshit. Uh, I'm French. I know what I need to do. <laughs> say, no, you got you to gotta, you know, you play uh, and respect the rule. I'm going to say, oh, you're going to complain about salaries. You're going to say, I don't understand this person. She's making much more money than uh, the same person in France. And, uh, and she leaves the office at 5 p.m. Uh, in France, the people are still in the office at 7. Like my French accent, I hope. But so <laughs> all those questions, they always come. come you know, you, you, and, and, and so you, know, you get to a point where you say, how can I play the game? But bring my my little something to to the game. It's really, uh, what we try to do. Yeah, and um, j- just coming back to the culture thing, but also, you know, you, you're talking about the whole COVID situation at the moment. I mean, how it, it'll just be interesting to know how you've managed to, you know, obviously working with teams remotely um, and now, you know, globally as well. How you've managed to keep that that same culture because. Um, I mean, just for example, just speaking to to a couple of the guys in your team while we, you know, we're, you know, sort of prepping for this interview. They said they'd been working from home since March. They haven't been into the office, you know. So, how you managed to to keep that culture, um, you know, as you know, how you've wanted to grow it over time. So, first of all, my answer will be a transitory answer because we're still in it. And we're still evaluating the, mm. the potential positive or negative impact of, uh, of this uh, work from somewhere else uh, phenomenon. Um, to give you an idea, recently I asked our HR director, what was the percentage of non-Boston-based people we hired before COVID and post-COVID? And before COVID, it was 10%. Post-COVID, it's 52%. Uh, obviously hiring people in Boston was a core driver of our hiring strategy. And it was, a uh, something that was a constraint on our hiring. Um, I don't know yet what the impact will be of having so many people, not in the office, so many people new, so many people who have never met each other in real life. Uh, so many people who have not woke the, you know, the, 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 cafeteria, uh, having um, random spontaneous conversations with fellow co-workers. I, I don't know what the impact will be. Uh, I, I miss seeing people personally. I miss the open debate. I, I miss, uh, and my instinct is, is that 
we would have been better without that. I think that, you know, obviously pe people have been great. They've, 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 they fully embraced the situation. Two days ago, I, I, I was speaking to one of our, 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 our team members and I was telling her, if you don't go out now for an half an hour walk, I, I will fire you. Obviously, I, will, I was not going to fire her because I really like her and she's great. But I was like, you, you got to breathe. You're going you to go out. You got to pace your, your time. You got to. And um, so, you know, we've tried like we were doing. We, we started, we had stand ups every day. After 40, 60 days, we said, okay, now that's, you know, let's go three, three times a week. Then we moved to two times a week they became very kind of casual. Now we're trying to make them more, um, I would say, development oriented. We have town halls and personally, and that's really personal, I, I really look forward to, uh, to a world where people are back in the office. Maybe, you know, with probably a different approach to flexibility, which is clearly not the forte of French people when it comes to office presence. Uh, but um, but I, I think it will be better ultimately. What about from a business perspective, though, in terms of COVID? I mean, I know it's a difficult one to to assess, but if if there's more drive towards online purchasing because we can't at the moment physically shop on certain, you know, certainly here in the UK at the moment, it's you know essentials only kind of thing from from physical shops. I mean, has has that helped in in your success this year? I mean, obviously it's been you know such a difficult and unpredictable year, but has that made an impact or? or is that an irrelevant um, issue? No, I, I think there's different ways to look at it. First of all, our customers have been able to better adjust to COVID thanks to their marketplace. We had customers who literally had stores shut down. Their even their e-com operations were not functioning. And the only thing they could sell were products on their marketplace. So literally they stayed afloat uh, uh, thanks to the, the marketplace. We had a lot of clients who share merchandising and assortment strategy overnight by leveraging their marketplace. So, so that was good for our clients and obviously their employees and, and, and their customers. The, the, the trend towards marketplace did not wait for COVID. If you look at the last five years, marketplaces have gone from 25 to over 50% of online transactions. So there is a trend. Uh, clearly, this trend has accelerated in the last uh, in the last few months. Um, and from from a miracle standpoint, we have seen more and more businesses kind of move up marketplace in the priority chain. You know, marketplace. When I started this company, marketplace was never in their priority chain. Then it became top ten, but ultimately only the top three get really done. And and now we're, we're, we've seen that we are really progressing up to be top one, top two, uh, which 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 is it, which is good for for our clients. So, and you know, like I'm going to quote my uh, you know my my favorite uh, British person, which I have his his memoirs here, uh, Sir Winston, uh, and and you know uh, he has this. Uh, I mean, something like in every great crisis lies a great opportunity, which he kind of shares with Einstein, which which is kind of good. And uh, and I, you know, we, yeah, COVID is a is a is definitely a great crisis that that will help or uh, push businesses to accelerate their their needed transformations. It's really exciting, Adrian. Um, changing tack slightly, obviously a big focus of these this podcast series is talking about communications, and we're kind of the re one of the kind of inspirations behind the series is to pass on lessons to other um, CEOs and leaders around um, sort of issues around communications. And we're wondering whether you might be able to share what your biggest communications challenge has been along your your journey and career. So. The one biggest. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think top three. No, I'm just... when, no, but when I when I came to the US, um, I hired this guy. It was not a great hire, but he, he always said, uh, 
you know, Adrian, uh, fake it till you can make it. And, and when it comes to communication, I think that my biggest challenge and opportunity has been to understand what that expression meant for me and how should I resonate with it uh, from, a, from an investment, from a messaging and from a culture standpoint, which are, you know, all the things that are reflected in, in, in communication. So um, it was, you know, how much do you amplify your message? We are the, the, the biggest transformative, greatest innovation of all time since fire in the stone age, you know, or uh, the French version, uh, we are a uh, SaaS technology built in Java that allows uh, to, to create uh, online marketplaces for third-party sellers. You know, like, you know, where do you, where do you go on that kind of spectrum? Um, and, 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 and so really, um, my, my, it, it's ongoing and I have, I'm lucky to have also, you know, great people in, in our team, but it's always trying to understand where should we position ourselves in, in that? How can we at the same time be a no bullshit company, but don't be a boring company. Then undersell yourself. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, especially in B2B, as we were saying, you know, like uh, even when you raise 300 million and you become a unicorn, a lot of the, the press, they say, yeah, but, you know, we don't like to talk about funding. We talk about products that impact people. So you try to say, yeah, but, you know, indirectly as a company, we, we're really impacting people as consumers and, and people who keep their jobs. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that's already uh, three levels down from, uh, <laughs> from what we... So, so there is this uh, ongoing questioning of, like, you know, how do you build a brand in B2B? Um, there is this, there, you know, in communication, there is this theme around, you know, category creation, which has given rise to, I would say, a whole religion of... of Everyone wants of, their own category, don't they? Of, of practitioners and, 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 um, and, and it's still, you know, for us, it's still a work in progress, to be very frank. And, but I always refer to that kind of, you know, Am I am I am I faking it in an honest way, or am I on on the verge of being dishonest in the way I I I, I and and that's what we personally we don't want to go. And sometimes we see companies and competitors go across the 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 border, and we're like, this is so unfair. This is full of shit. This is a, sorry for the the cursing on your podcast, that's but okay. but. <laughs> But, and, and it you know, it really brings up questions like how can people, how can people and go out and say big lies and, and, and still, you know, get away with it. It is a very fine line. Yeah. Like where, where you cross that line from being kind of just telling an, a, a good story to telling something which is complete fiction. Yeah. I, I heard a great question, actually. I, I, I wish I, I could credit it to someone. Um, where I got it from, but I can't, but I'm going to use it anyway. Just picking up on, again, what, what you're saying. It, it was in an interview, uh, someone was saying, um, like, if, if your company didn't exist tomorrow, would you be missed? I'm just, I'm just like intrigued to hear what you were saying there. I, what, what's your answer to that one? <laughs> it's, a t it's a tough one, isn't it? I, I think, I think, the, I think the, the um, big picture answer should honestly be no that's the french answer <laughs> <laughs> but i think if we if you ask our clients and you go back to being more closer to the ground they will tell you if it weren't for miracle we wouldn't have we wouldn't be live so fast we wouldn't have such a reliable scalable platform we wouldn't benefit for from so much expertise, we wouldn't have grown our business by 20, 30, 40% highly profitably. Uh, and, you know, they, 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 they would have looked for other ways, but I, I think in a way, 
the market we serve exists. So once a market exists, it, ne it needs people to be at the forefront of serving that market. And that is what Miracle is. You That's know, when we, when we, during COVID, the, 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 the French government uh, reached out to us in the early uh, weeks of March, because like in many other countries, there was a complete uh, shortage of PPE products. So masks, shells, gowns, everything for like essential business and healthcare workers. And, um, and we, you know, we're well identified company in, in France. So the, the, the minister actually called my business partner and said, Hey, uh, Philippe, can you do something about this situation? And Philippe said, uh, yes, we, we can stand up a marketplace and that will connect suppliers of PPE products with demand for PPE products. And so in 48 hours, we, we launched a platform called Stop COVID-19, where we were able to onboard initially dozens and hundreds of suppliers all from all over the world, from China to France to South America of, of masks, gels, and, 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 and it's millions today. It's over 150 million products that have been sold on this platform, which we've kind of Oh, I mean, we've kind of, we've operated for free, uh, and and so you know, I, I, going back to your question, you know, uh, what would the world be without your platform? I can say that without the Stop COVID nineteen platform, a lot of people would have probably uh, been in in very dire uh, uh, conditions. So it's a it's our modest contribution to to our society and communities. That is a very good answer to a curveball question that I threw at you. I'm very impressed with that one. But that's a brilliant story as well. Very, very good. Very impressed. No, it's a great story. And and just sticking with the, the going back to the theme of, of communication. So you kind of outlined your your kind of Achilles heel or the thing that you're kind of you know grappling with all the time in terms of the fake it to to you make it um, uh, you know point that you made. As you've been grappling with that. You know, what's the kind of best piece of advice anyone's given you on communications? If it's one person who gave me a, a piece of advice or if it's kind of my, uh, inter I mean, interpretation, but I think that the key to successful communication beyond, you know, being creative, uh, obviously, if you do bad communication, you do bad communication. But I think the key is to consider it as a program and not just as a project, as a one-time project. And I think if you, if you approach it like that, it helps a lot solve all the short-term dilemmas that you will have around ROI. Well, if I spend X on PR compared to X on Google AdWords, uh, how, how do I compare the, the return on investment? And, and, and then, you know, what I'm saying about considering it as a program, it doesn't mean that you're going to say, oh, yes, it's a program. So I, I, it's in three years, four years, because, you know, but it's really as something that needs to, to, to be deeply integrated in everything you do. So, for example, uh, we used to have a very siloed approach. To, to what we did in marketing in general. We would do a, a customer event. Uh, we, we would write a piece of content. We would uh, uh, attend a partner event. We would record a video with a, with a customer. Um, and, and those things, we would realize that, oh, what if we had actually treated them as a, as a holistic thing? How much could we have amplified the message and how could that kind of be phased in our in our communication plan. Um, and so this is really what, what we are working towards more and more is to, to really approach things as a, um, like now, for example, we say uh, no more communication without a client and a partner involved. Um, that's it. Like if I see one thing where we go solo, I'm like, why? You got to explain why, why we went solo. Once again, as a B2B company, it's like, okay, once we've raised money and announced the round and done the PR around the round, we got to come up with, with other things. And, um, and so what are the other things in B2B? It's 
customer launch, customer success, um, and um, and and so once again, if you if you involve more the customer, more the partner, the customers of your customers in those stories, suddenly your 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 communication can be much more structured, uh, much more uh, you know have have a broader reach and and be more long lasting. So that's kind of my learning. Adrian, we've probably kept you about 10 or 15 minutes longer than we promised we would. We've got one final question for you. Um, it's actually something we've we've asked all our, our, our guests during this unicorn series. Um, if you were to go back in time and speak to your old self, what guidance would you give to yourself about communications and what steps would you encourage yourself to take in order for you and of course your business to excel in uh, communications? Uh, that's a difficult question, but I think there's, there's, um, and that's where, you know, not pre prepping for the question becomes a, becomes a burden, but <laughs> no, but more seriously, I think, and, and it's going to be specific to, to, um, to us, but, uh, there's two things and one I've kind of talked which is what I've just said which I could sum up as like always prefer surround sound to uh, one, one, dire one directional uh, sound when it comes to communication so always think about how can it be surround sound and the second thing is when you localize communication I mean, I would say, okay, localization does not equal translation. <laughs> if you want a, a formula. <laughs> I'd agree on that one. Um, Adrian Nissenbaum, thank you so much for joining us online today. No, thanks to you. And uh, it was a pleasure, Russ and Brendan. Thank you. Enjoy the chat. Thanks, thanks Adrian. So much. Best of luck with everything. So, uh, Brendan, what did you think to that conversation with Adrian? Uh, no, I really love that. I think it's always very interesting talking to people that have kind of lived and operated in different countries and cultures. Um, and you probably could say that there's not many places that are more different than, say, France and, and the US. I thought the point he made about the importance of, of vision and how, how, that, how valuable and, and critical that was at the start of the, the, their journey in terms of getting people on board was... Um, was a point that that really resonated with me. I thought the point he made towards the end about communicating in surround sound rather than kind of uh, you know uh, in sort of single channels, I think, is a, is another really um, key point, which you know uh, means that you get much more value out of everything that you do from a communication standpoint. And then I thought it was a very insightful point he made about kind of where do you find the balance on that line when you know the fake it till you make it you know obviously no one wants to be or not everyone kind of feels comfortable going out there and kind of stepping beyond that line where it's something that they're kind of you know making things up so again a really uh point well made and um so i think people are going to really enjoy uh this episode that's great well that actually wraps up this episode so of course if you want to find out more about miracle their website is simply miracle.com but with the spelling m-i-r-a-k-l.com uh, we'd love to hear your comments on today's chat you can share them on our facebook page on our linkedin instagram and twitter feeds they're all linked from the top of the website at csweetpodcast.com uh, where you'll also find all our previous shows and supporting show notes plus links to where you can subscribe for all automatic downloads of each episode uh, via the likes of Spotify and Apple. And if you've liked what you heard, then please do give us a positive rating and review. Uh, you can also subscribe to the Without Borders podcast from our partners at Taito. And all the details for that are on their website. Just head to taitopr.com and uh, click on the podcast link in the top nav bar. If you are a unicorn leader yourself and you'd want to be part of this series, then please do get in touch via the contact form on the website at csweetpodcast.com. Plus, of course, anyone can get in touch with us too with any feedback you may have. And finally, if you want to reach out to me, you can do that via Twitter using at Russ Goldsmith, or you can find me on LinkedIn. But for now, thanks for listening and goodbye.